Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hi, and welcome to Self-Improvement Atlas, the Personal Science Insights Podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm Marie Stella, your host from Melbourne, Australia. Let's start the show. Welcome back to Self-Improvement Atlas, the Personal Science Insights Podcast. Today, we're talking about something that's everything, everywhere, all at once. And no, not the amazing 2022 film starring Michelle Yeoh. It is art. I mean, well, yeah, the film is art. But we're also talking about art in general and how it can serve as a form of self-expression. And I'm joined by lino printmaker Stephanie Basile. She documents her lino printmaking process on TikTok and has garnered over 100,000 followers on the platform, which is just impressive. Hi, Steph. Lovely having you on the show. Hello. Thank you so much for coming in. No worries. Um, We can talk about everything everywhere all at once, if you want. <laughs> well, maybe in the open mic section. <laughs> yeah. So how are you going today? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. I'm excited too. So tell us a bit about your line of printmaking history and how you got into it, how you found your style. Cool. Um, I will keep it relatively brief, I guess, because it's a long story somewhat. Um, probably first got to do line and printing back in primary school, touch pointed again in high school in art. Um, I think I might have done it at TAFE, not sure. But then like everyone else in the pandemic, I picked it up again in 2020 and I kind of struck a deal with my partner and said, all right, I'll just stick to this one medium for 12 months just to kind of limit the creativity, which is sometimes a good thing. And from there, I started posting it online and it really (laughs) took off. So then I just was like, well, I think this is the medium that I not only enjoy, but people enjoy watching. Um, And so I stuck with it. And here we are today in 2023. And I'm making a somewhat living off it, which is nice. That's amazing. Yeah. That's really the dream to make a living off what you love doing. Exactly. Um, are there any other kinds of art that you dabble in? Um, yeah, I guess I, I've i practiced art for most of my life um, in different forms. And I, I've done all different types. I'm not very good at like oil painting, that kind of thing. I wish I was better, but I'm sure if I practiced, I would be. Um, I used to make uh, like shrinky dink jewelry and like I used to embroider, do embroidery art. So I've always done something creative, but I think landing on liner printing was a good choice. (laughs) That sounds really good. I wish I could start doing lino printing at some point but I just never like I never even learned the basics of it so it just seems like something that's so far out of my realm and I just use like gouache paint or something no you can so easily like so if anyone out there including yourself wants to start lino printing I would highly suggest just getting like the speedball lino printing kit because you get everything in it you don't need anything extra and you can just play around with it. And if you like it, you might want to continue and buy more things. And if you don't, then you can just keep it in the box of hobby stuff, which I seem to collect with all my crocheting and random hobbies that I collect over the years. (laughs) Oh yeah, that is actually a good idea. And I guess you don't have to be like perfect at it or anything. You can just be a little like Mm tippy of your toes into the hobby. Uh, Now, before we get started on the interview, uh, we like to get to know you better. So I'm going to ask you a few questions about what media you like. Okay. This is, have you met Steph Basile? Uh, what is your favorite book? Oh, I really like my favorite book that I loved since childhood was Alice in Wonderland, which is just like, it's just a real, literally a trip. Um, but 
recently I've been, I read Evelyn Hugo, which is just a really nice, easy read. I really enjoyed that. And I'm currently reading Yellow Face, which so far so good. So very similar like reading style of like Evelyn Hugo, where it's just easy. And like, I think at the moment I'm not looking for anything to, uh, which is bad to say on a self-development podcast, but you go through times where you need to ingest a lot of information and then sometimes you just need enjoyment. And yeah. at the moment, yellow face is enjoyment yeah, and interesting. Yeah. So what's yellow face about? It is about, oh, so I'm not giving anything away. This is literally the, the plot synopsis. It is about a two uh, liter- two writers. Uh, one is super successful. One is not so successful. They are friends, acquaintances more so. Um, they are together one night. The successful one dies. It happens in the first literally line, so I'm not giving anything away. She dies and then the woman who's left behind, she takes the girl's manuscript that she's just written and claims it as her own. And it, 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 the name implies obviously the woman who dies is I believe she's Chinese mm-hmm. and the um, woman who takes the manuscript is white. Mm. So it's very, you know, it's an interesting yeah. concept and um, I think um, it's it's written by an author who's written a few different like more f- fantasy style books and this is her first kind of foray into like I guess more like current social media style things, but it's so far very interesting. Oh, I think that'll actually actually be so interesting because I always really liked fantasy, so I just mm. imagine like the mm. whimsy of fantasy mm. into this more serious genre. Yeah, and it's kind of nice. like it's a bit you know like melodrama y, mm. like you know it's it's not so serious that you're like oh, but it's tackling a serious kind of I guess topic issue. Yeah. and issue like you know. As all white people, we just sometimes take things we shouldn't, so <laughs> claim it as our own. So I think it's tackling that kind of big concept in a more digestible way, mm-hmm. which is good. That's really interesting. I'm going to have to check this out, and I don't say this very often with books because I I I I I'm such a slow reader, mm. so I I generally like don't really think that much with books, uh, but. I do with films and I'm curious to know, do you watch films a lot? I have been watching a lot more films recently. I've been trying to sit down and watch them. What has been your favourite recently? Besides Everything Everywhere All at Once, which was great. And if you haven't seen it, you must. It was so good. Um, But (laughs) this is a really acquired taste film. It's called Barb and Star Go to Vista Del Mar. It's a Kristen Wiig and Annie... I think her name is Annie Malamo or something. Kristen Wiig, though, if you know her from SNL and you know her, like, target lady sketches, um, it is her, these two middle-aged women go on a holiday together. They're best friends. They go on a holiday and there is a super villain. There is a lady named Trish. There is a kid doing a lip sync at the start of the film. It is a pure comedy it's probably sits in the more stoner comedy realm (laughs) but it is so much fun um I'm not I'm not a stoner at all but I find (laughs) it really (laughs) just preface that um but I find it really funny and it's just something to watch and enjoy Mm -hmm. um another film that I would recommend which is a bit more like I guess if you wanted to think and digest a bit more um it is called um sushi Dreams, Sushi Dreams of Jiro, which is about uh, the best sushi maker in Japan. And it is, have you ever seen? No, but it sounds really interesting. So what do you like about it? Um, I think it, it, uh, sorry, let me start again. I really enjoy the conversation it has between a father who is at the top of his game in the top industry and the son who is set to take over and that dynamic is super interesting. And the one thing that I've always pulled from that documentary is that uh, Jiro believes that he, because everyone's like, your sushi's perfect. And he says, the moment I reach perfection in my sushi is the moment that I I will die because that is my purpose in life is Mm -hmm. to make that perfect sushi, but I will never get there. And it's kind of, it puts into perspective, like, you will never be perfect. Nothing will ever be perfect. Even though everyone says to him, like, his one Michelin starts with this sushi, which is so wild because it people would say it's just sushi. But it's like, if you go and work with him, you've got to, you know, wash the rice for 
two to three years before you even get to touch a fish. Like he's all about like everything has a purpose and everyone's like, your sushi's perfect. And he's like, absolutely not. It will never be. Oh. And it's just like, yeah. oh, my God. It sounds very like um, it sounds like one of the those films that makes you question everything mm -hmm. essentially. And I do love um, a film like that that, you know, makes you reconsider perspectives. Yeah. So I definitely would be checking that out. Um, do you listen to podcasts much? I do. I constantly have a podcast in my ears. So what's the last podcast that you've listen to um i just finished listening to scamander um which is um scam and amanda rolled into one it is about a woman who uh in america who says she has cancer does she maybe not is that the entire uh premise of the podcast yeah so it's a it's a uh, true it's a woman who's investigating an uh, investigative journalist mm -hmm. and she talks to all the people who were affected by amanda it's it's probably easy to say yeah she was lying about cancer um mm -hmm. but how she does it and it, lying about something isn't necessarily illegal mm -hmm. but some other things are and yeah. how it affects the people around you i would say if you are somebody who is either going through cancer or has had somebody recently gone through it it might not be the podcast for you it does get into detail it does show the impacts of cancer of people around you and what that means but it is so interesting that does actually like i don't want to keep saying this because i don't want to cheapen the quality like the like the meaning of my <laughs> that's so interesting but that genuinely does sound so interesting and i love podcasts um where investigative journalists do all of these deep diving yes and it's all of these women who are, and men who are around her during this time and you know it's so fascinating to believe that someone could lie about that because mm -hmm. you just would never if someone said to you i've got cancer you'd believe them you wouldn't question it yeah so it's kind of like oh wow you did this for years why yeah and also there's a difference between like accidentally maybe like blurting out a lie versus doing it for years yeah. and years to so many people yeah and it's not only that like she got obviously got her church involved there's money involved there's you know uh, media involved so it's interesting mm -hmm. i highly recommend so what's the last course you've completed oh i'm currently doing one Ooh, what is, is that? It? I'm yeah. doing a marketing course with a, a la lady named Maddie. She's just done a course with her marketing business called Birdcage Marketing. And so far it's super interesting. Um, I've actually found her on TikTok, which is I guess where we all get our information now. Um, so I found her there and I just was really resonating with what she was saying. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to invest some money into myself again and learn something new so that that's currently what i'm doing that's amazing so how long have you been in this course for oh literally like l less than a few weeks and i've learned so much already and it's one of those ones that updates as you go mm -hmm. and i think it's only going to get better <laughs> that's great uh how long more do you have uh i don't know i think you, you, it's self-paced mm -hmm. so i guess as she up the, she's uploaded probably like five or six modules and then she will continue to upload more. So it delves into, you know, finding audience, talking to the audience, marketing through socials, through at paid ads, through website, all that stuff. That sounds really interesting and I hope you get so much more out of it. I hope so. <laughs> so now move on to the interview where we ask you more about um, exploring art and what's that got to do with personal development and our identity. How do you personally define personal development i think it is i guess constantly not necessarily constantly but willing to work on yourself through different facets and different avenues i don't think it's necessarily like i'm going to go and do this or i'm going to go and read this book but all of these things combined through life experience as well helps you develop into the person that you are currently at this point, whether that be good or bad. <laughs> so what are the main challenges either you think are obstacles in general or 
challenges that you, maybe you've personally faced in pursuit of self-improvement? Uh, um, I guess so. I, I've, I'm someone who actively learns quite easily. I have been interested in being a better person, probably more so in the last five years, um, and trying to actively get better by doing and reading and consuming all of this content that makes you better. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess an obstacle that I've faced probably, uh, recently is I, I've been sober for three years now. Wow. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. That's thank amazing. you. Um, but I guess for, I didn't realize probably drinking was such a problem for me until I stopped doing it, which mm -hmm. isn't really, but I guess an obstacle for me is like, I didn't have the ability to see that issue. <laughs> and I don't know if this is really answering the question. But no, it totally is. I think that I have developed more in the past three years as a person than probably everything before that. And I'm not saying it is for everyone because I don't think, it, you know, it needs to be. But I think that having a stimulant like that in my life was really um detrimental to my personal growth and learning. So I think removing it and as I say raw dogging life <laughs> <laughs> that's what I like to say as well yeah I'm just raw dogging life 24 <laughs> 7 now it takes away the ability because I think when we and it can be it doesn't have to be like alcohol it can be or drugs it can be you know food or you know an addiction to game oh, it, yeah we all try and self-medicate yeah. in some way right some kind of Indulgence, like yeah. something that you indulge in to take away and, um, the stress. From yeah, life. and you know what? It's not always a bad thing. Like you want to, you want to have joy, and you want to be able to indulge in something. Sometimes it's when you can't stop that's mm -hmm. the problem. So I think that um, taking that out of my life has made me be able to see life a lot clearer. Which you think it's not like that when you're drinking. You're like, oh. I'm so woke and smart. <laughs> and you. No, and it's also like very subjective, especially yeah. if you run in circles where everyone drinks just as much as you do or even more. Mm. It's even harder to recognize. Mm. Um, but that's great that you um, identified that as an issue and stopped. That's, that's really amazing because most people take way longer to get sober. Yeah, and I think because uh, we see, I guess, alcoholism as an old person's thing um <laughs> like we're like oh the old guy down at the pub yeah, he's an alcoholic yeah with the, uh, yeah, with the, uh, the, with the schooner or the whiskey whereas I think uh, it's actually you can my rock bottom might look different to somebody else's rock bottom who's been doing it mm -hmm. since they would you know till they're 60 but I think that being able to stop and realize because at the time when I stopped I didn't think I was like I wasn't I didn't make this grand gesture to be like oh, I'm gonna stop drinking and um be amazing and you know do all this stuff I stopped and I said oh I'll, I'll give it a month I'll see how I go and then I gave it a month and I said okay this is a bit bit of a bigger issue than it was okay, let's see if we can go two months and two months turned into three months and then it was like, all right, we're doing a year. I can't believe you even got to the one-month mark the, on the first try. Um, That's I was <laughs> A lot of therapy, a lot of support, um, and I think for me it was I had reached a point where it wasn't – I wasn't doing it socially anymore. I was doing it at home. I was mm -hmm. ending on the bathroom floor. Mm -hmm. I was drinking – a lot to self-medicate. Mm -hmm. So when I stopped, it was like, oh, you've been doing this for a lot longer than you thought and you've been self-medicating for a lot longer than you thought and then you have to deal with all those issues, mm -hmm. which you still deal with. <laughs> <laughs> what an uplifting thing to talk about. But it's real. <laughs> yeah, it's, real it's true. And... and the more we talk about it, the more that we can um, identify that young people do have these issues, it's mm -hmm. probably better than letting it pass by and then we're all 60 and go, What? Exactly. And um, did you find that art helped with the coping at all? Yeah, I think it was good to be able to have something to distract you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, talking about replacing one thing with another. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you can get a lot through out. Uh, you can get a lot of your emotions out through art um, and, you know, journaling, that kind of thing. So many creative outlets, you can kind of get all your emotions onto a page or and just leave it there. And it doesn't necessarily, you don't need to show other people either. I think this is 
thing, especially in an age of social media, we feel the need to show everyone everything <laughs> because if we're not creating and posting and making content, what are we doing? Um, so you, you can create something and keep it to yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think if, especially if you're journaling or getting art out onto a page that is quite emotional and you're quite close to it, sometimes best to like leave it to one side for a minute, think on it and then be like, do I actually want to release this into the world? Yeah. Um, I want to chat with you a bit more about, you know, using art and exploring art for personal development. But before we get too far into that, um, I also want to ask you, how would you define artistic exploration? I think artistic exploration is doing anything creative that doesn't have an end goal. Doing everything. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just That's okay. I think, yeah, said, I yeah. think sometimes if we're exploring, it's we're diving into something and we don't know what the outcome will be. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes when we go into doing something like art, we can we can go, all right, this is what I want the finished product to look like. This is what I want it to be. But if we're exploring and if we're really doing something, we might get something out of it. But if we're just throwing everything at it and seeing what sticks, then that's exploring. Right. It's kind of like when you are playing a video game and you're not really sure where you're going and you just like find little treasure chests along the way, not really actually progressing in any way. You're just collecting things and looking at the views and yeah. seeing whatever. And even like if you defeat enemies or something like that, um, you don't really get anything out of it. You're just kind of playing around. Yeah. And I think video games are especially good at this. They have stories within stories within stories, mm -hmm. which is so good because these people who make these games are incredibly creative. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you might not get to the finish as well, as cliche as it sounds, you might not get to the finish quicker, but you'll <laughs> enjoy the journey, um, you know, but it's <laughs> yeah. true. Like if we're, if we're actually enjoying the art we're doing and making, that's part of, like, that's kind of all that there is that's really. All that matters. Yeah. yeah. Um, so back to when we were talking about exploring art for personal expression, self-expression, that's the term, right? So in your opinion, how does art shape our personal identity? Well, it's probably one of the first things we do as a kid. We learn to colour and draw before we learn to write or even speak sometimes. So I think it's something that we get to do very young. Um, and sometimes we get we get that will be fostered for our whole lives and we get to do it a lot and then sometimes it won't and it go away from it. Mm -hmm. um, a question? Oh, right. Um, how does the art that we practice shape our personal identity. Okay. So yeah. So you get to do it from a young age and then you, sorry, I'm married. Um, you get to do it from a young age and then you either stick with it or you don't. And I think that if you stick with it, you will find out more about self-expression just purely from like the way you dress, the way you view things, the way you get, the way you see the world will be different. Um, and I think the cool thing about it is when you see someone who stopped and then gets to go back to it and gets to start to be creative again, because I'm talking about the person who did it as a child, got told that no math science, uh, which is also, there's art in that. But, yeah, there is art in that. But, oh, yeah, but it's a know, whole like, other topic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but like the um, traditional forms of art, yeah, essentially. Yeah, exactly. If we go into, um, you know, you go into an office job and then you get to, you, you start living in the real world, quote unquote, and then you get to come back to it. Seeing somebody come back to it and really start to get into it, it's quite cool to watch someone do that because I guess I've been creative all my life, mm -hmm. so I don't know any different. But seeing somebody be reignited and in get pure enjoyment out of creating is so cool. And people, like, you don't have to be great at it. Mm -hmm. Like, I think there's this, mis like, I'm not even that great at it. I do oh, it. Come I, on. Like I'm, I'm 
I'm better and I will continue to get better because mm-hmm. I focus on it. But you don't need to be great to pick up a pen and draw. Yeah, you don't have to be the best. No, at it. and I'm never going to, like, there are some lino printers out there that are amazing, like, so good. But I'm okay with where I'm at right now. Mm-hmm. And, like, if you're wanting to see, like, jump in there and you're kind of holding yourself back because you're worried about it's not going to be as good as, it won't look as cool as, who cares? Just pick up the pen. It's do it. Yeah, I think that's something that I realized as well in my mid twenties because um, as a child, I loved art so much, but there wasn't much of a space for it where I grew up. And maybe it's also like the household I was brought up in because my childhood best friend's mom was an artist so she really did um help my best friend kind of nurture that love for art and you know pick all types of art up and really appreciate it whereas my mom my parents didn't get into art at all so I just never got into it and a lot of the extra classes I took were like the furthest thing from art. I went to science camps, <laughs> which is also like, again, it's, it's like kind of art, but not it's really very different. the um, <laughs> art that I was hoping for. Yeah, yeah. And then just like moving away and being able to explore the kind of art and the types of art that I want to do um, has been very interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what you said reminds me a lot of the next question, which I have for you, which is how does participating in art influence our personal development journey? Has it influenced you personally in any way? Yep. (laughs) Sorry. Could you elaborate? (laughs) (laughs) I can, yes. Um, How does participating in art, okay, Um, I think you get to know yourself more when you get to create art and things and whether it be music or, you know, a play or fine art, I think you get to start to explore different parts of yourself that you might not normally have done, Um, you know, that might be topics that you might want to kind of touch on and delve into and I think that it can also start a lot of conversation with people so uh, if we look at someone like Keith Haring who is an amazing street artist his work is quite simple and the way he gave it to his audience was he put it on the street but the topics are quite serious so it started a conversation of What does AIDS mean in 80s New York City? Like what does safe sex with gay men look like in New York City? What does love look like in this world? And, it, and you know, it was barking dogs. It was on, you know, Sesame Street. Like he contributed so much to us as a culture that it got conversations happening that might not have happened in households, you know, it... I think art has two sides to it. There is the creating of art, which you can learn about yourself, and then there is the exploration of art movements and artists and the stuff that we consume can start conversations and self-development in that way. So there's two ways you can do it. And when you create a piece of art and you give it to the world, you kind of give up ownership of it, um, whether that be a movie or music or you know, anything, you kind of give it to the world and go, here you go, decide what you want to get out of it. Um, And I think that it can spark really important conversations and um, and it can show just like in representation is important in, you know, TV and movies and on the news and all that kind of stuff, it's also important in art. And I think that we get to have really important conversations around um, who we are as a people um, because we get to see different types of art and the impact that art has. Um, and even so, an example would be recently, I think it was in the Met, they've acquired this work where 
the subject matter is, it's like a work from the 1800s or something. Mm -hmm. And the subject matter is uh, two white children and they realise that there was actually behind that had been painted over, there was a black uh, slave child in this portrait originally yeah. and they painted it out, they'd erased it. So they're going back in and putting that stuff back in and there'd be hundreds of portraits like this. Like yeah. you can't tell me this is just the one that it mm -hmm. happened to. It's the one that you discovered. Exactly. So it's kind of interesting to look at this and go, all right, that's a conversation we need to have. This erasure, this erasure, is that the word? Yeah. This yeah. erasure of like uh, the way that slave, the, the sl what happened that it's we've kind of just whitewashed it and gone no 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 don't look like don't oh look that here. didn't happen yeah. at all and it's like well no having this art it is important because we get to have these conversations about it and why did we do that and you know and and I think that develops us as people because it's easy for us especially as white people to say yeah no 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 it was just of the time like but we get to have this conversation now of well yeah it was of the time but look, look at the times we're in now as well yeah look at the art that's being created now look at the art that is allowed and not you know I think that art has can contribute quite a good conversation and artists will always like big art not bigger any artist can at when you look at certain bits of time will have a commentary of what's happening in the world around them. Yeah, uh, I love the way you put that very, very eloquently um, as well. And so if I understand what you're saying, if like the uh, rambling gets <laughs> reeled in a little no, bit. <laughs> uh, no, that was perfect. Like you gave so many examples and the, w the, the way I think of it, of what you said to condense it is essentially, well, arts can both feel fulfill you as a person on a macro level, but also you can use art to contribute to a larger cause. Mm -hmm. So it works in those two ways. It's like input and then output yeah, kind of. exactly. And I think there's a difference as well between like art that is created for consumption and art that you create for yourself. Mm -hmm. Like you're doing two different things yeah. at this point. Like yeah. if, if I'm, you know, not, if I'm creating art, you know, as somebody who's not looking to be an quote unquote artist and I'm just creating at home, it's going to look very different. You know, like if I'm buying an adult coloring book and coloring, it's different than if I'm going out making, making a political statement like, like our way way or something, you know, it, and I, they are both important. Yeah. They're both important. No, one is not better than the other. Yeah, for sure. And it also is like kind of a circle because you start by creating art for yourself and then you start think you might start thinking about creating art for other people and contributing to another a larger cause, which in turn also um it also contributes to your personal development. So either way. Yeah. It's, and, yeah. And I think you, as an artist or being somebody who gets to consume art, I get to go in and learn something different or new about myself through viewing, mm -hmm. you know, other people's works and having, yeah, and getting to have conversations Yeah, within my own head usually. <laughs> so do you ever come across any challenges when you're trying to embody your personal identity through art? For example, like maybe do you ever get creative blocks or, you know, identity crisis maybe? Yeah, I think there is a, a fair amount of imposter syndrome when you become an artist. I think that you will always think someone is better. You will always think, always think someone has a better point of view or is t more talented in what they do. Um and there is the dreaded creative block, which can happen at the moment. Touch wood. I'm not there, but I know at some point it probably will happen. You're not the, have you never experienced the creative block? I get sparks of creativity. So I will create and then there will be a moment where I just have to stop mm -hmm. and then I'll pick up and I'll get an idea like that. Wow. And then it's time to create again, which I guess you could say there's a blockage there because I'm not. And you're just you can't kind of constant, avoiding it. Yeah, yeah. It's like you can't constantly create and yeah. you will find yourself your times where you're in flow with, you know, 
um, creativity. There are a lot of people who write excellent works on this um, that are much further along in their journey than I am. Um, you've got things like The Artist's Way, Big Magic, um, these are books, um, you know, the, the people who are further along, they talk about this, how to get over this creative block. So I think if you are in creative block, or you have a blockage, you can, there are plenty of resources out there now that um, people who are much wiser than I am um, can help you get through. And also just talking about it and talking to, you know, being open about it and saying like, oh, I'm not really feeling it or I can't be bothered. And sometimes when you can't be bothered, just sitting down and trying to do it for five minutes you'll start to get back into it. Like even if you're like, oh, I'll just draw a frog for five minutes. I'll just minutes. do whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like I'll colour this page for five minutes. It might. It will probably open you up to spark something else. Yeah, I didn't even realise that I did it as well actually because I would often put off whatever art that I was doing for a really, really long time thinking that I didn't want to do anything because there wasn't anything in my brain but I actually didn't try. Mm. So then I sit down, try to do it after like a year and – Somehow I do actually, there are things that I actually want to do. Um, so that's interesting that you brought that up. I didn't realize that other people did that as well. Yeah. And I think if it, with anything that you're putting off, if you just set a timer for like 10 or 15 minutes and you just say, all right, I'm just going to do 10 minutes. I'm just going to do 15 minutes, whether it be going to the gym, reading, mm -hmm. art, anything, the thing that you'd want to give up the most, just go, all right, I'm just going to do 15 minutes. And then you'll get into it and you'll just be like, oh, it's not that bad. I'll just keep going. Like it, when you think about it, going to the gym, the hardest part of going to the gym it's is starting. going. Yeah. Like so if you're just like, all right, I'm getting in my car, I'm going to the gym, I'm getting out of my car, I'm going to go stand on the treadmill for five minutes because that's my 15-minute time, you're going to be there for more than five yeah. minutes, I guarantee you. It's all right. That actually goes into a lot of other tasks that you put off as well. Like one time I was procrastinating during I think something for uni and I it wasn't that big of a task it was just very very simple but for some reason I was struggling so hard with it and I was at my friend's place um to I don't know like for some accountability or something and he was like all right I'm gonna set a timer for 10 minutes and in 10 minutes you have to finish this or else. Yeah. And I was like, okay. And <laughs> magically within like 10 minutes, like right on the dot, I finished it. Yeah. The task is never as big as you think it is. Yeah. It, it never yeah, is. It's always just the like thought of yeah. starting oh, it. Oh God. And like, like it's it's little things, dishes, washing, mm -hmm. you know, anything. You're just like, I don't want to do it. <laughs> but it's like, oh God, set the timer. Yeah. <laughs> that's so true. All right. Um, so now moving on to the practice slash habits section of the show where we ask you a bit about your personal habits with practicing art. Mm -hmm. So what is a habit that you practice to develop the way you emulate your personal identity through art? I, I'm pretty routine driven, um, which is not, we can't do it every day, but I think that there is a misconception that art is quite, you know, sporadic and it's, you know, late at night, smoking ciggies, like, <laughs> you know, it's very like, you know, bohemian. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in my practice, I find that I am better when I get up early, walk the dogs, go for a run, have a shower, sit down and work from a, you know, nine to five perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and... It's not to say that you're not up at 3 a.m. because you've had a spark of creativity and you're all of a sudden like, I've got to do <laughs> it you now. you need to do it now, right uh, now. Yeah. Um, but there are times where it's like, no, just the nine to five grind of being an artist, which sounds really lackluster and less fun than when you go, people go, oh, um, you go, I'm an artist. And they go, ooh, cool. And you're like, ah. Well, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I think being able to structure my days is helps me create a fair amount of work um, because I don't think I've hit the point where I've created my best work yet. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me personally, there will come a time where I am creating work that I'm like, oh, 
ooh, I am amazing. <laughs> and I do think that already. Like, But there, I know that the best is still to come and having consistency and being consistent, consistent in my creativity will get me there. Yeah, that's a good mindset to have. Um, and so what are some of the good things about doing this routine, having this routine? Like specifically? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so I don't think you necessarily have to get up early, but I do. <laughs> um, I think get up whatever time works for you because if you're a night owl and you're going to create more at night, then get up at night. Like it doesn't really matter what type of day you do it, but I think if you uh, if you get up and you I sit down, I journal, I get all my thoughts out for about 15 minutes. And then I go on to my day and I start to go, all right, what do I actually have to get done here? And I write a list and then I start ticking it off the list. I think there is an added element these days for me as well with content creation. Mm -hmm. So it's juggling making the art and creating content. Two things that you have to do these days, I think, but take different times. And if I could just create art and it would just appear online, that would be great. But it's not going to happen. Yeah, it takes so much more work than people think yeah. it does. Yeah, and um, it and you don't have to do it if you don't mm -hmm. want. It's not something that's required. Mm -hmm. It just so happens that it's part of my life, mm -hmm. so I've got to do it. Um, I guess if tips for having a good routine is just pr try different things and see what sticks. I meditated for a long time. It worked for a bit. I'm not doing it currently. That's fine. It doesn't really – you're going to move in and out of things. Yeah. You're going to get really good at some stuff and you're going to keep it forever and then there's some stuff you're going to probably dip in and out of and use and as needed. That's part of the human experience. Exactly. So do you ever set aside some time to um, do art that isn't part of your work? I have more now. I have to – I have started to set myself a goal of I must do a minimum of an hour a day of art. Mm -hmm. minimum for work or for yourself both mm -hmm. so it's two hours mm -hmm. I guess in total some days I'm better than others um but, <laughs> but uh yeah I ha I have started to do more my own and get back into what you would call um sketchbook practicing and mm -hmm. you know you start to sketch out things more and more and um kind of delve into that world again because it's something that you do a lot when you're studying art mm -hmm. and then you kind of get out of it and you're like, I don't want to research anymore. I don't want to draw a hand again. Yeah. So it's like bringing it back to the basics. Yeah, and you know what? Sometimes just drawing stuff that doesn't necessarily have impact or need to be anything mm -hmm. like I was really lucky I got to go and do this fun little collage thing where I got to like draw and like make a collage and I went with my best friend and you know we had a good time together there was we made a really silly little picture which is on my fridge like it's so silly I love it um and I got to do that and it was so enjoyable and sometimes when especially when you get start to do your creative outlet as your job, mm -hmm. it will start to change what that is for you because mm -hmm. it is now a job and I do something where I release a print on the first of every month. Yes. That is a deadline I have to keep. Mm -hmm. So I must create this lino print. It's a certain size so I know that but what it is, it changes month to month. So that Although I really enjoy doing that and I love what I I love whatever I create for that month. It always the spark comes and I go, Yep, that's it. That's what I'm doing. There is an element of that's for work. Okay. I want to do something creative. That's just for, for me. Fun. And like, it doesn't have to mean anything. And you know what? I'm not gonna be a collage person. Like yeah. I'm not gonna do this. But then from that I got I was like, Oh, I really like this color combination. I'm gonna use it in this. So, you know, being able to play and have some fun with art, because sometimes art can feel really serious. I think the art world can feel really serious. It's really not. We're mm -hmm. doodling. Yeah. Like, let's all take a breath. And there are times where art is impactful and it should be, but there are times in the creative process where you're like, what am I drawing? Like a dog? Like, like I have no idea what I'm doing yeah, right now. I'm drawing a 
banana dressed <laughs> as a cowboy. Like, <laughs> it's not that serious. Yeah. So I think there's an element of play that you got to bring back into it. And especially if you're doing it at home just as, like, for for enjoyment, just being like, this is not serious is probably the biggest thing I could say. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Steph, for answering all my questions and taking your time out of your day. Um, Now we move on to the last section, which is the open mic section, where you get to talk about anything that you're passionate about that doesn't have to be related to the topic at all. So take it away. The floor is yours. We did say before this it was going to be about ghosts. (laughs) (laughs) Do you still want to talk about ghosts? I mean, there's a lot of things we can say about ghosts. Are they real? (laughs) I think yes. I think I think yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> which, which I I've gotten the comment a lot, especially like living here. Mm. I always get the comment the comment that like I well not the comment, but like I get looks of judgment a lot when I say that. You're I talking to the wrong ghosts. people. <laughs> yeah, it's always the atheists <laughs> and the um, agnostic. Oh, yeah. Ones. My dad would, he's such a science man. He's like, ghosts aren't real. That is yeah. literally just matter. Yeah, it's always the atheists. Yeah, yeah. But the good thing is like a lot of the atheists that I know, they've softened up a little bit. Mm-hmm. So that's nice. Um, and Have you ever seen a ghost? No, I've never seen one, but I have witnessed um, a possession. Thing. No, amazing! Yeah, that... no, this is meant for you. <laughs> You're meant to talk. It's no, the, I'm... Your, it's you your can't, open mic. You not can't mine. leave us on a possession and just <laughs> dip out. I'll like... tell you after. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, you listeners, comment below if you want to hear the possession story. <laughs> Have you seen any? Ghosts? I've seen a ghost. <gasps> yes. Tell. Um. So I used to live in an apartment with so there's two parts to this story I lived in an apartment with a few so there was myself my partner and two friends at the time my friend Kirsto and I we went and saw a psychic we saw this psychic separately she did not know we lived together she did not know we were friends Mm -hmm. so uh, Kirsto went in she said you've got a ghost in your house walking around she's lost Yep, cool. You'd say, yeah, sure, psychic lady. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. that seems a bit, <laughs> <Sure>. whatever. <laughs> um, then I went in and she goes, oh, you've got a ghost in your house. She's walking around. She's lost. And I went, okay. We hadn't spoken at that yeah. point. And I said, okay, go home. And I was like, oh, she said this. And because I was like, oh, my God, she said that to me too. And my partner said, yeah, I hear her walking around all the time. And I said, this is weird. Her sister used to live in the apartment. She said she'd heard her walking around as well. This is all coming out. I'm like, why did you let me live here? Then one day I was getting ready for work. So it wasn't even at nighttime when you start to see things. Mm -hmm. I was getting ready for work. I walked out of the kitchen and I turned to my right in our little hallway and the bathroom door was closed, but I saw a woman standing in front of the bathroom and I knew instantly that it was not, it wasn't somebody in the house. It was just a woman black in black. And I just stepped back into the kitchen and went, okay, I've just seen a ghost. And then I walked out <laughs> and she was gone. That's it. And uh, we asked her to leave nicely and she left. <laughs> oh, how did you ask her to leave? You just say, thank you for being here. Bye Off now. you go. <laughs> thank you. And she listened. Yeah, we oh, didn't hear nice. from her again. That's nice. Um, I guess is... Uh, yep. Um, so that's my open mic. Also, I guess the thing that I would probably employ your listeners to do is um, pick up a pen mm-hmm. and draw the ghost that you saw. <laughs> and Did you? You know what? I haven't yet, but maybe I will. Yeah. She probably appears in things that I don't even think about, but she's she's like an old Victorian woman, like very mm-hmm. like typical, stereo- <laughs> what a stereotypical <laughs> ghost. Um but yeah, I guess Lame. I know. Oh, couldn't we have a modern guy on the phone being like, stocks, sell all the stocks. Um, but I think, yeah, if I could pick up a pen, pick up a paper, like art supplies don't have to be expensive. I think it's important to bring creativity into your life, whatever that looks like. That could be the outfit that you wear, a song you write, a book that you write that never sees the light of day, that just five minutes every couple of days, I think you're going to start to want to do it more and you're going to 
find out of this whole world. If you're not a part of it, like you get to find out this whole world that exists. And there's a lot of good, sorry, this is a tangent. There's a lot of good documentaries. It's open mic. I can yeah. say what I want. <laughs> there's a lot of good documentaries now out on like Netflix, Binge, um, that talk about these brilliant creators. And it's not just in the art world. There's some about like art crimes. There's some about, you know, heists, which I really enjoy because it's art and crime mm-hmm. mixed together, which we love. There is beautiful documentaries about like people like Iris Atfeld, who is just this like woman who really created this fashion scene in New York City and she's 100 now and she's still amazing. And, you know, you get to meet all these different people that you not necessarily literally, but you get to meet all these different people with different perspectives and some of them you will agree with and some of them you won't, but you get to consume this beautiful media Mm -hmm. and see the world through their eyes, which is something art really can do. You get to see what somebody else is seeing. Mm -hmm. I do love the ever-growing just collection of media that we have these days. Mm -hmm. Um, We can get some eyes into wherever we please most of the time because um publications like wired are now doing all these deep dives and asking all these expert questions that we don't get to ask personally and then so so having people do all of that and then we get to consume that and have a look without actually having to be in the world of it itself Mm. is very interesting and we get to learn so much yeah and I think it's cool that – and a second prong to that, if you are an artist, you got to start putting yourself out there on social media. That would be my biggest thing. And it oh, yeah. sucks. <laughs> um, and you're going to feel resistance. But you got to just start making the work and putting it online because the art world can feel a little bit shrouded in mystery. And there is a reason for that. It, it, has be- it used to be a real bohemian space mm-hmm. and then it became really dr- gentrified and people knew that they could invest money in pieces and there's a lot of corruption behind the money in the art world. Um, so it feels a bit gatekeepy, um, but you can, with social media, there are so many, there's cons, but there are so many pros now to get your work out there. So that. I know that we've just done the open mic, but I do want to ask you Go for it. because it's related to the topic anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, if someone wants to start promoting their artwork on social media, what advice do you have for them and what are the pros and cons? Um, my advice is film everything. Film everything. As much as you can. There are some times where you just can't be bothered, but film as much as you can of the process because although it might seem really mundane for you, for people who don't create like this on a daily basis, it's super interesting. Mm -hmm. And there are other art like it's not like other artists, I love to watch their process and I love to know more about them as a person. We're in this age now where we want to buy off people, we don't want to buy off big corporations. Mm -hmm. Face to face is more important than ever. So if I get to know a bit about the artist behind the artwork, I'm probably going to feel more connected to their oh, art. Oh, yeah. I, I think I can actually second that, that because that's how I found you um, because I was following your TikTok for a while and I had seen all of the documentation that you did and it was so interesting to me and you started, I think, putting your face on TikTok as well mm-hmm. or Instagram, I can't mm-hmm. remember. Um, and then it helped me feel like, you know, a bit more familiar with who you are as an artist yeah. and connect with your work even more. So I definitely do. Yeah, when that. I first started, I really just did voiceover and like overhead shots. Another tip, get one of, if you're an artist, get one of those like, you can't see it on a podcast. <laughs> like it's like one of those wire claw things that holds your phone mm-hmm. um, over your work. Oh yeah, the like over the head. Yeah, they're so handy. Just buy one. They're $10. On oh the, really? Yeah, like on the dreaded Amazon. Like I'm not, <laughs> I've like it literally connects into the desk and like sits over your work. Yeah. Honestly, the best thing I ever bought and it's the cheapest thing I've probably bought for my art practice. Yeah, I always wondered how people did it because I only have uh, like a Manfrotto tripod at home yeah and that doesn't cut nah, it you got to get the overhang which right. is important and it literally will just kind of screw onto any surface it kind of has a claw clip thing and it just hangs out like you can adjust it the best thing um if you are you 
When the cons about posting on social media, is there's a few. A lot of people will say um, in the old art world, they don't want you to be, if you're trying to get into the gallery space, essential, the old gallery space, there are new gallery spaces, but they will say you don't want to be a social media artist because they want to cheapen it, um, which I don't think is necessarily true anymore, but it depends on what type of world you want to step into with your art. I think it's stupid um but there is an old guard usually in the bigger cities that will say like you don't want to be a social media artist but you know why they're saying that because they're scared because it is taking a lot of power back from these old kind of establishments um and garbs and anything yeah so do put yourself on social media and contribute to the bigger cause as well at the same time and don't be afraid people aren't going to like you that's Mm -hmm. just a fact people aren't going to like you not everyone's going to like you yeah and that's okay in in daily life as well yeah you're not for everyone that's Mm -hmm. fine (laughs) you're going to find the people who like you you're going to find the people who you like like if you think about it people and I have started to get this more because I have a bigger audience now but I have people who um want to tell me how they feel about things (laughs) things <laughs> and sometimes I will get spicy in the comments because there's one particular really? there's just a few particulars who come up every now and again mm-hmm. and they want to pick a fight and sometimes if I'm in my mindset I will pick a fight back mm-hmm. um but you, you the best advice is just to let it roll off your back because it's really not that important <laughs> there's obviously something bigger going on with them it has nothing to do with you they are just jealous of your journey um but yeah you will your art is not for everyone and that's okay Mm -hmm. it will be for someone that is so aptly put thank you so much Steph thank you today if our listeners want to find out more about you and what you do where can they go um you can find me on Instagram TikTok or my website at cheers thanks a lot I'm going to spell it for you because it's spelt differently than what you might think it's c-h-e-e-r-s-t-h-a-n-x-a-l-o-t you heard that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so follow her on Cheers. Thanks a lot. On, sorry, I'm going to repeat that. I mixed up my prepositions. So if you want to find Steph, you can follow her on TikTok, Instagram, and was it Twitter? Uh, no, just my website. Just the website. <laughs> uh, I'm not on <laughs> Twitter now known as X. At Cheers, thanks a lot. The links will be in the show notes. And thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. We'll catch you in the next episode. You've been listening to the Self-Improvement Atlas, the Personal Science Insights Podcast, produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. For more episodes like this from 10 different life management perspectives, search LMSL on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts so you can get updated on everything we have to offer. We have a wide range of topics readily available for you to check out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it and subscribing to our channel as it helps us grow and bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at pe.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Marie Stella. Thanks for tuning in.